the most significant challenge as a refugee I face in my career pursuit is the constant rejection due to my refugee status, and this really hampered my dream of working for the United Nations as well as becoming an independent entrepreneur. Because it's impossible to register and implement my entrepreneurship ideas under my refugee card. The common challenges for refugees in the country include the language barrier, uh, movement limitation between the cities, lack of financial resources, taxes, inflation, and the high competition in the market. As a refugee in Uganda, I faced numerous challenges whereby I had opportunities to travel abroad, but it was very hard for me to get a visa that could enable me to travel in time. I also faced limited access to education challenge because as a refugee, I left DRC Congo. It was very hard for me to come with my academic papers, which hindered me from accessing scholarship opportunities that could enable me to become the best version of myself. My hope for future is to see the transformation of these plans, strategies, and pledges into concrete action. And I really aspire to see the decision makers at Global Refugee Forum actively working on policy changes that enables refugees and asylum seekers to engage in meaningful social and economic inclusion and entrepreneurship that enables them to not only escape the level of burden, but also contribute to the host country's economic growth and prosperity. I wish to see the stakeholders and decision makers taking great steps to solve the causes behind the refugee crisis in the world. Also to protect their rights from any kind of abuse or exploitation or being a target for hate speech, discrimination or racism in the host community. My vision for five years is to spearhead innovative projects that contribute to social inclusion, advocacy and as well as education for refugees nationally and globally. In my business, I have uh, employees, South Africans and refugees. And the call is that stakeholders, partners, funders, they may fund directly refugees themselves. Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, a round of applause to the amazing voices from refugees. I have to say that those those uh, claps are not uh, with the the greatest energy I wanted. So a round of applause to those amazing refugees. It is a pleasure and honor to be the master of ceremony for today's uh, very important discussion. I go by the name Jean-Marie Shimwe. Um, I am the co-founder and partnerships lead for the Voices Community and currently part-time working with the RC, Refugee Seeking Equal Access at the table. Uh, thank you all for joining us. As you can see, you all look lovely. Can you clap for yourself for coming to this event? Thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much for joining us today for what should be a fascinating in-depth discussion on unleashing the economic potential of forcibly displaced and stateless uh, people through entrepreneurship and employment. This event is organized by the core conveners of the multi-stakeholders pledge on economic inclusion and social protection, which aims to advance uh, holistic self-reliance of refugees and other forcibly displaced and stateless people and host communities. Our conversation today uh, continues on the global stage, a series of regional conversations that have shaped the pledge, including the Nairobi um, uh, RLO convening in Kenya, where I co-facilitated a three-day uh, workshop with 20 refugee-led organizations who contributed to perspectives and recommendations to advance self-reliance, and inclusion, including the just-concluded Africa Private Sector Forum in Accra, Ghana. As a person with lived experience of forced displacement, I can say that economic inclusion 
is a topic that is close to my heart and to the hearts of many uh, refugees who struggle on a daily basis uh, to find meaningful employment that is matched to their skills, to follow their dreams, uh, to start a business, and even take uh, a small step just like opening a bank account. We will hear from two panels uh, who will offer perspectives uh, on the challenges, opportunities uh, related to refugee employment and entrepreneurship, along with a series of perspectives from stakeholders who are contribute to, contributing to this work in a meaningful way. Uh, as we move uh, through our discussion today, I, I invite you to share your perspectives on social media, referencing the hashtag uh, inclusion for shared prosperity, and of course, uh, hashtag uh, GRF2023. Um, it is my distinguished pleasure to welcome uh, and introduce Mr. Sajad uh, Malik, who will offer briefing opening remarks and will then moderate our first panel uh, discussion, policy and evidence. Mr. Malik is the director for the Division of Resilience and Solutions at UNHCR. And uh, please, a round of applause to Mr. Sajad as he takes off the text of floor. Thank you, Jamari, and a round of applause for you too, Eric, to, to be out here moderating this, this session. So, uh, <clears throat> very encouraging to see refugee participation uh, in the side events and throughout the next three days. You'll see many of them uh, speaking um, from what they're going through or their own experiences, um, how some of them had really made through uh, some very difficult times who moved in um, as refugees to camps our um, Nansen Award winner, um, I had the opportunity to be with him on a panel yesterday. He moved to the DAP camps when he was age three, uh, went through his education, um, and then he is now a successful journalist who is running libraries. So that's uh, the, the benefit of uh, inclusion. That's the benefit of education um, and the work that, that we are collectively doing here today. So just to um, um, highlight that uh, since the last GRF, uh, it's just a milestone, uh, which is not something that we are proud of. We are concerned about it. And you heard it in the plenary throughout the day, <clears throat> the, the 114 million. By the time we were at the GRF, it's from then to this GRF, uh, the last five years, more or less uh, four years for the GRF, but five years, the population of forced displacement has doubled. Uh, and as we speak, there are more getting displaced and more protracted the displacement is becoming. And the scale is, is severe. It's uh, the management of this, this population is becoming even more difficult. Their protracted uh, displacements are even more challenging given the context that they are held in, in those situations. Um, the intersection between um, uh, conflict, climate, uh, socioeconomic decline, all are becoming intertwined and displacement is becoming more and more complicated and, and difficult to, um, in a way, becoming even more difficult to manage. The socioeconomic data is increasing, showing us that the drivers of displacement are mutually reinforcing. So it's important that we handle all these issues in a very mutually inclusive way. The topic that we are looking at today <clears throat> is also to highlight that the world of work is transforming rapidly. Uh, the private sector engagement and many of you around uh, in the room here, uh, it's impressive to see the participation in this room is becoming very much engaged. We have um, regional um, uh, uh, authorities are getting very much involved in that. We have uh, uh, from the panel, you'll hear that how governments and private sector are getting very much involved in this in this work that we're doing it. And we recognize that much more needs to be done. Um, refugee hosting countries are <clears throat> bearing the brunt of hosting these refugees. We heard a few statements in the plenary today. There'll be more we'll hear over the next three days. But they are the ones who are hosting these refugees. They're the front line. Uh, on the front line, 75% are in low and middle income countries. Many of them are in the neighboring countries, refugees that are being hosted. Uh, and the policies in these governments, uh, in these countries where the refugees are hosted, <clears throat> are as generous as they can be, <clears throat> excuse me, but they need support, they need help, they need uh, all the efforts that we can all put in to make sure that self-reliance and resilience in, of these refugees is looked into. 
just to highlight, and there's a banner um, in the room which shows that 67% of refugees have the right to work uh, of all the refugees that we have. And less than 50% have access to jobs and business opportunities. So despite the fact that um, they are very progressive um, in many of these countries, opportunities are there, but still there are uh, restrictions that is making them uh, not being able to achieve their full potential there. We need more and better multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral commitments. <clears throat> and your participation here today and the next two days is also in the same way in that we need to get more engagement of all partners, not necessarily one or the others, but we need a multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder pledge there. And we need to match the generosity of those refugee hosting countries. Um, they are the ones who are um, there um, for not for one year, for two years. They are the ones who are there for sometimes for decades uh, in, in, in hosting refugees. But we need to create an enabling environment in that. So we have a very strong panel today. <clears throat> and let me introduce you to the panel uh, who will um, try to sh share their, their um, experiences, what they're doing uh, for the refugees, uh, resilience and self-reliance and the work that they're doing. On, on my extreme right is Mr. Abdi Abdullahi. He's the manager of the Fragility and Resilience Division within the Resilience and Climate Action Department of the Islamic Development Bank. Abdi has been working with us on a number of occasions. He's been engaged in many, many activities in Islamic Development Bank, and he is going to share his views and thoughts about this. <clears throat> to my right is Dr. Wokne. He's the Executive Secretary of um, EGAD in Eastern Horn of Africa, as you know, one of the largest refugee hosting region. And for decades, they've been hosting refugees in, in, in that region. And EGAD has been very active with the platform, but many other initiatives that they have uh, uh, been working on. So we'll hear from Dr. Wagner mm -hmm. um, uh, some of the, the, the work that uh, EGAD is doing. And on my left, we have um, uh, Ms. Elizabeth Campbell, US Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Population, Refugees and Migration. Um, PRM um, is one of the staunch supporters of the work that we do for refugees globally. Um, their support has been remarkable throughout, and they have been with us for um, an envy situation that no matter it's an emergency or protracted. So um, we'll hear more from you, Elizabeth, how uh, you are supporting <clears throat> the work that we're doing in this domain. Uh, next to um, Elizabeth, we have Ambassador Carsten Storr. Uh, he's the DAC Chair of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. <clears throat> we have done a lot of work with OECD, uh, OECD recently um, on, um, for, um, on data, on analysis, on um, uh, the common position on um, forced displacement, and in many other areas that we're working together. So we'll hear from Ambassador Storr how uh, OECD is helping us in this area. And then to the left of uh, Ambassador Strauss is my colleague uh, Mia Seppo, Assistant Director General for Jobs and Social Protection at the International um, Labor Organization. Again, ILO has been working very closely with us on, on a number of areas, and we'll get to hear how ILO is helping move the, 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 the needle on a on, on number of those issues. So with that, I... Um, uh, open up the questions. Uh, we'll have a uh, question for all of our panel members, starting with you, Elizabeth. Um, the U.S. government is recognized for its considerable support and critical diplomacy in advancing refugee economic inclusion in different contexts as an enabler for durable solutions. So what are the learnings and priorities that you can share with us today on the humanitarian development peace coherence? Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be on this panel, speaking on a topic that is of great importance um, to the United States and with our very close partners, UNHCR. The Global Refugee Forum provided us with an opportunity to do a lot of inward thinking as we continue to um, engage globally in refugee contexts in, in every region. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we, like most of you, realize that this very critical issue can really only truly be advanced by deepening existing and new partnerships across the spectrum from humanitarian to development to the private sector, by innovating in terms of what we're doing, how we're financing, whom we're working with, um, and also, um, uh, um, of course, 
continuing to think strategically about how we use this tool to achieve solutions. So as part of um, our work, we started by looking at ourselves. Um, I represent the humanitarian arm of the State Department. We have our close colleagues with whom we work closely in USAID. But to start to think about how we actually build out this solution, we also engaged in much more serious and structural conversations with our colleagues who work um, at, on the development side of things, but also um, on, on private sector. We expanded outside of the US government to look look at um, our relationships with um, our multilateral uh, development and finance uh, co uh, corporations and partners. And, and over time, basically landed in a place where in September, together with the World Economic Forum, we were able to um, join a call to action to encourage humanitarian and development organizations, donors and host governments, and the private sector to co collectively join forces to mobilize 10 billion in investment capital to scale up economic activity in fragile markets with an initial particular focus on Northern uh, Kenya. And I think this, this initiative has enabled us to build a very broad base uh, coalition where each partner is bringing a comparative advantage with the aim of looking toward refugee inclusion but also inclusion of um, host communities who live in these very fragile um, environments. So that's sort of the, the big kind of frame um, that we've been working um, through. Um, the second piece that's critical to that, and again here with huge thanks to our partners at the IFC and UNHCR and their newly established uh, joint initiative, um, that is something that we um, will continue to deepen our relationship with and, and support, again, recognizing that in every single context, there must be um, a private finance, private sector um, component um, or lens through which we are figuring out um, how we bring solutions. Um, the third piece is we're very proud to um, continue our support for the RSRI initiative, um, uh, Refugee Self-Reliance Initiative, and will continue to provide diplomatic um, and financial support uh, through them. We also, um, through our existing MOU with the TENT partnership, um, use our diplomatic capabilities to look for ways to expand refugee employment in um, a variety of places with an initial focus on Ukrainians in um, parts of Europe and also now moving into Mexico and other parts of Central and, and South America. And again, here, this is about um, using the diplomatic leverage that we can bring to open doors um, for private sector corporations who want to um, look at the work that they do, the supply chains um, with a refugee with a refugee lens. Um, and the other point I would just make that is is very um, central to all of this work, of course, and I mentioned at the top, um, are the multilateral um, development um, banks. And here, um, the IDA window, which was an innovation in 2016, something in which the US engaged very centrally, it, it, it continues to be um, a critical uh, piece in, um, in, in economic inclusion. And then also the GCCF, um, again, another really important piece for supporting middle income countries who are hosting large numbers of refugees. These are two uh, specific vehicles where the United States will continue to play a very central role in providing financing, but also diplomatic support um, to also think through different ways in which um, we can continue to um, uh, reform these institutions um, in a way that matches the challenges that we um, are all facing today. Oops. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so very comprehensive approach on, on um, not only leveraging the diplomatic, um, you know, um, um, in in a way, inclu uh, in, in encouraging inclusion, but also very concrete um, engagement plan in in bringing in the private sector, and you also support through the IDA um, contributions that are getting through is really a, um, a, a huge potential that we can need to now look in with with the private sector to expand that in many of those areas. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, um, Dr. Workney. Um, in the <clears throat> 
the Kampala Declaration on Advancing Jobs, Livelihoods and Self-Reliance for Refugees, Returnees and Host Communities, um, has been an important regional instrument for socioeconomic inclusion in the framework of the EGAD support platform. So what it is needed to implement uh, the declaration at the regional, national, and local level. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I came from uh, a very dynamic region uh, and also the region of 4.5 million refugees, more than 13 million uh, internally displaced people when I'm talking about Kampala declaration mm -hmm. or uh, about livelihood of the refugees, I'm talking about 4.5 4 million people. So the number is in sometimes more than uh, the number of the states, the, the population of the state that we have. So it's a big number, one of the, uh, the, 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 the areas that we host a lot of refugees, even if 80% of the refugees are from the region itself, from one country to the other. Yes, uh, one of uh, the progressive action that's taken by uh, our member states in the region is having two declarations uh, and others there, the Nairobi Declaration and Kampala Declaration, mm -hmm. which allows, which speaks about what we are talking now about life and the livelihood of the refugees, the right to movement or the right to have uh, a job the right to access to the finance and so on and so forth. So uh, the Kampala Declaration is one of the most important uh, declaration in terms of refugees. That has enabled uh, the refugees to have uh, to access to local jobs and also <laughs> local finance, as well as to coordinate and cooperate with the private sector in the region. Even if we have a challenge of data, that with that I want to highlight very important uh, element, which we always lack the accurate data in terms of this thing, uh, uh, because of the movement of the refugees and the movement, the dynamism of the situation, the conflict, the climate change, all these factors which uh, has an impact and that the number is growing. So the issue of data is there. Having Kampala declaration uh, means not the end of the thing. Still, we have a lot of challenges. We have a conflict in the region. Everybody remember the Sudan issue. Still now we are having millions of the Sudanese who were hosting millions from the neighboring countries, the refugees. Now they are displaced. They, 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 they themselves are refugees. We are losing on our eyes one of the biggest country in the region. And also because of that, we are facing the real challenge that, that the region is facing. So uh, the De Kampala Declaration needs the following things, that, that most important thing. So the implementation, the full implementation of Kampala Declaration is one of the challenge that we are facing. That needs support from international community. In terms of policy harmonization, in terms of implementation of all the context of what Kampala Declaration says. The other point is supporting the regional cooperation. As you know, IGAD is a regional organization, a regional economic community organization, which works harmonize the policy of all member states and working directly with refugees in the border areas and, and uh, collaborate in collaboration with member states. So that regional uh, cooperation needs a policy alignment. So we need, we need support on this area to take this thing to the people, to the refugees, really to the victims, the vulnerables that, that now they are in challenge. So we need that uh, a very important thing. So also uh, uh, when we talk about supporting IGAD, we are talking in other ways, supporting our member states as well. So the member states, eight member mm -hmm. states with a population of more than nearer to 300 million out of that, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about the refugees that that they need, you know, sensitization to the public, and also most importantly, the political commitment of the 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 the, the community, the politicians, to harmonize, to make easy the life of the refugees in the in the region. So that is also another very important intervention that we need. 
Finally, I want to talk about also to the local government empowering and working very closely with the refugees and giving training for the refugees themselves. So there is a program called TVT, which works, uh, which support the capability, the capacity of the, the refugees, which allows them to share, you know, the benefit of the economic, uh, the economy of uh, the countries that, that, that they are living. So we have a lot of challenges. This, the number of refugees are increasing because of the conflicts that I was telling. Also, we need a lot of support in terms of mobilizing resources, which is a very scarce at this very particular time, and we need a support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Bogni, and sharing your, your perspectives on full implementation of the Kampala Declaration. Uh, it's it's a very uh, complicated region in terms of displacements and, and one of the largest. Um, I now turn to Ambassador Starr, um, OECD. <clears throat> um, so we know, uh, Ambassador Starr, that the members of the OECD Development Assistance Committee, which OECD DAC, have recently adopted a common position addressing forced displacement with an HDP nexus approach. In this light, what role do you see for sustainable development cooperation to support host countries, communities, and refugees with economic inclusion? Thank you very much. <clears throat> and thank you for the invitation to, to join this panel. I'll basically focus on, on, on three things in, in replying to this, uh, this question. Uh, first thing is uh, the refugee compact as such and the innovation that it actually provided. I had the pleasure of taking part in the preparations of that as chair of the executive committee of the High Commissioner's Program many years ago, uh, and also basically to work uh, with UNHCR on developing the foundations of that compact and basically laying the foundation for the meeting that we have here today. Um, and I think that it was obvious at that time already that, that the premise that we have, the socioeconomic inclusion of refugees in host countries is a win-win proposition here now. That premise is quite solid. For refugees, it basically allows them to maintain skill, morale, sense of contributing to society, uh, earning money, improve livelihoods, basically all the positive features that you can by engaging in a society. For those communities, it was an injection of human resources, of human capital. It was a contribution to sustainable development. It was basically easing the host, host burden and also driving growth and development in society at large. So why was it then so difficult? And I think that the main thrust of that discussion was um, at, in order to make it work, this socioeconomic inclusion had to be seen as a, an, an, a thing here and now, short term. It was not to be basically overshadowed by being a durable solution. So I think that that basically that, that <clears throat> inclusion, as we talk about it here, is a holding pattern. It's a pragmatic and rational choice of both host governments and, and, and refugees, but it does not prejudge what or prejudice what uh, the form what form of durable solution we will eventually talk about. It prepares both return, it prepares for 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 uh, in local integration, prepares for resettlement through upskilling and through work experience and integration in society. So it has the same value no matter what we are, we are talking about. And, and that, I think, is the key to creating a win-win situation that we can actually get in, involved in this without having the end, end zone in, in, in view uh, from the beginning. So that's my first point. The second point is on, on, on what development cooperation can do, what can development assistance do uh, to this. And, and uh, it, it, it's very clear that the 200, and 200 plus billion US dollars that, that uh, OECD DAC members last year made available for development cooperation is a waste, a waste sum of money, but still only 0.2% of the global economy. And this has to be shifted and divided through a lot of, of worthy, uh, worthy uh, courses. Um, in order for us to understand and to basically zoom in more on what development cooperation can do, especially on socioeconomic inclusion of refugees in host countries, I think that basically the analysis and the data that, that OECD has developed, uh, it basically points to, points to five, five, five things. The first one is the foundational part that we have, basically development cooperation, assisting countries building 
uh, and, and maintaining economic prospects, both get applicable to host countries and to, to uh, countries of origin. And then we have more, for more maybe more specific elements that, that uh, evidence is showing that development cooperation can support inclusive national systems in host countries, in labor markets, in health, and in education. And that basically by weighing in development cooperation in this regard, we can actually help building those inclusive national systems. The same goes with uh, trying to be sure that uh, inclusion of refugees is, is, will help countries attaining their 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 sustainable development goals, and that 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 will make sure that they will also be available to to join climate action in in host countries. But one other element that's quite important in that respect is also that, that when doing this, you need to anchor this support in the priorities set by the host countries themselves. So it has to be part of the of the overall policies and priorities of the host countries in order to be sure that this will fit with the overall development as aspirations and ambitions. And then finally, and not least, of course, we see a lot of interest by the private sector, by private companies to get engaged with this. And development cooperation can also lift that engagement and encourage that engagement in, in, in host countries. The OECD Act just uh, adopted a few weeks ago new uh, reporting rules for private sector instruments, which also will help basically aligning ODA and private sector uh, investments in, in, in developing countries would also have a bearing on, on, uh, on this issue. Final point. You mentioned the uh, the um, the INCAF uh, common position. I'm going to present that uh, tomorrow as a pledge, but I think that that basically is a really uh, recent uh, contribution by the donor community, by DAC members, in order to be sure that we now have an up to date encouragement uh, of uh, it's an in, in, it's a common position on forced displacement with HCP Nexus approach. That's the official title. But the whole point of that is that it 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 basically creates a basis for advancing even more uh, durable cooperation for sustainable development in support of FD host countries by all partners, uh, including bilateral multinational development banks and the private sector. So this is basically one step on the road towards engaging more ODA in this important sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we're very pleased and proud to have been associated with the common position. It's available on OECD website. Um, it's it's a, a very good document and I think very visionary, uh, the implementation of which will really help us a great deal in addressing forced displacement with HTTP Nexus. Thank you very much. Um, my colleague from ILO, Mia, if I could ask you um, ILO's priority is to advance social justice and promote decent work. What are some key elements that are needed as to achieve decent work in forced displacement context? Thank you. Thank you for the question and thanks for the opportunity to be part of this really important discussion this afternoon. Uh, decent work livelihoods and social protection are critical to any durable solution at, at the heart of the HDP nexus. Uh, responses to displacement crisis must extend beyond humanitarian assistance, especially in protracted uh, situations, to make it that win-win that the previous speaker referred to. Um, ILO pledges to advance equality and non-discrimination in labor market access and labor protection in forced displacement context. We are committed to the Global Compact uh, for Refugees and our joint action plan with UNHCR charged a strategy for overcoming challenges related to job creation and decent work. The guiding principles on the access of refugees and recommendation number 205 for peace and uh, resilience guides ILO's work for inclusive labor markets and a collaborative effort with government, employers, workers' organizations, and uh, partners. We recognize the legislative, linguistic, and regulatory barriers faced by displaced, displaced uh, populations. ILO works to extend the rights of all workers uh, with a specific uh, focus on the most disadvantaged and uh, of course women, youth and uh, people with disabilities. Moving on to the how, our interventions are strategically designed to create decent jobs, facilitating market access, enterprise development, access to finance, financial inclusion, 
and developing sustainable economic benefits for refugees and host communities. Through our partnerships, we take a comprehensive approach, supporting national and local institutions, steering inclusive skills development programs, acknowledging refugee as talents, supporting job placement, enterprise creation, and implementing labor-intensive initiatives for self-reliance uh, and integration of forced, uh, in forced displaced uh, context. Critical to all this work is our advocacy to extend social protection to refugees and host communities. Um, as I think everybody in this room knows, local context matters. In many countries, refugees do not have the same rights in terms of labor market access. We call on governments to address this urgently. In the meantime, we are working with our partners to find entry points to promote economic inclusion. For example, in Lebanon, we support the productivity of Lebanese farmers and refugee agriculture workers alike by improving the business environment and introducing new opportunities such as modern greenhouses. These results have been possible thanks to partnerships across the multilateral system and support from key donors like the Netherlands and the US and the Prospects Partnership uh, Program. In conclusion, the ILO remains steadfast in our commitment to overcoming challenges and achieving decent work in forced displacement uh, contexts. Um, ILO has an active engagement as the technical co-convener in the Mega Pledge on Economic Inclusion and Social Protection and as a co-lead on the 15% enrollment by 2030 Global Pledge on Refugee Higher Education and Self-Reliance with a focus on quality technical and vocational education and training. Together, we strive to include refugees in the labor market and to improve decent work for both refugees and host communities, underscoring our shared commitment to social justice and pursuit of a more equitable world for all. Thank you. Thank you, a strong collaboration between UNHCR and ILO on this front, and we are very, very pleased with the progress we are making together. Um, my last question is to Mr. Abdullahi. Abdi, if you could uh, give us, um, um, uh, how is it Islamic Development Bank created, creating economic opportunities for refugees and host uh, communities, particularly the youth in fragile and low-income countries? Thank you very much. And first of all, let me thank UNHCR for organizing this important session, which discusses very important and relevant topic. And from the Islamic Development Bank point of view, we have a 57 member country, out of which 31 are fragile and conflict affected countries. We host significant number, our member countries host significant number, number of global refugees and forced displaced people. To give you a picture, 70% of the global refugees are producer three ISDB member countries. Seven or eight of the top two Alif hosting refugee countries are our member countries. This is a fact that we cannot ignore. And this challenges us also as an MDB, multilateral development bank, which is designed to support a stable and normal, normal countries and refugees and forced displacement are becoming a protractor crisis that require long-term development interventions. And that's why the Islamic <clears throat> Development Bank realign strategy focuses on building resilience and tackling poverty. Not only building resilience in our member country populations, but also support countries that are hosting considerable number of refugees and internally displaced persons. Our fragility and resilience policy emphasizes the need for the bank to invest more in addressing not only the root causes of forced displacement through economic and social development programs, but also support refugees and hosting communities to mainstream our development programs and projects. To give you some of the examples and the successful programs that the bank has carry, carried out more recently, 
ISDB in 2008 has approved significant program for the education of the Syrian refugees that are in Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and also in Turkey. The idea was to enable these young refugees and hosting communities with the relevant skills. So we have been able to support around two, over 12,000 young refugees to access higher education, entrepreneurship development, as well as also digital skills. Graduates who have graduated this program as a young refugees are now remotely working in the GCCs based on the skills they have acquired from the, from the program. Building upon that successful program, the Islamic Development Bank has also approved and scaled up the program to support young refugees and hosting communities for member countries that are hosting over 1 million and above refugees and internally displaced persons. The overall cost of the program is 100 million and it aims to bring all actors, including multilateral development banks, UN agencies, civil society organizations that are very close to the poor and also support refugees, not only to address their needs in terms of entrepreneurship development and skills development, but also provide some incentives, cash incentives that they can set up their own businesses. And I think significant progress have been made we are supporting around 15 member countries. This support of the employment, entrepreneurship development and skills for young refugees require concessional financing as an MDP and also grant resources. And often these are very limited in the development financing. So what we do is we come out some sort of innovative financing to support. And that's why the Islamic Development Bank, Islamic Solidarity Fund for Development, which is our IDA type of the World Bank, have established the Global Islamic Fund for Refugees, which is designed to target, you know, uh, you know, social, uh, Islamic social finance and other zakat and sadaqat, which are designed to support this kind of noble causes. So we are trying to be innovative and also at the same time be ready to the challenge of the global refugees. We believe if we provide skills development, entrepreneurship development, and ensure that we advocate at country level and also at national level to ensure that the uh, livelihood development of refugees are mainstream in development programs and country engagement of the MDPs, we will be able not only to save and support refugees, but also we create hope for young refugees that might not necessarily have the opportunity to access this opportunity, if not advocated by those who are at the highest decision making in the development arena. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abde, for sharing and these perspectives. And we're really looking forward to further strengthening our collaboration with the Islamic Development Bank. There are many more opportunities that we're already working on. Um, so, um, Thank you all to, the, to all the panelists uh, for sharing your inspiring examples, regional mechanisms, policies, um, using um, the, the many tools that are available to us on, on refugee inclusion, local economic development. Uh, there's a lot of good work that is being done um, in, in many areas that is helping us move in Islam, on, on economic inclusion um, more than ever before. We realize that if Inclusion helps um, in many ways. Inclusion helps those who are displaced, but inclusion also helps the, the regional development, the, the hosting communities and all the rest. Exclusion yeah. is costly, exclusion costs. So I think the only way that we are looking at it that to work towards um, inclusion in the long term is the most important way of looking at it, especially the socioeconomic inclusion, more education, and, and those bring benefits in the long run. We have around 300 refugees in the GRF. Um, you'll see them around. Mm -hmm. These are all those um, refugees who were given the opportunities, they availed those opportunities, and now they're very productive members of the society. They're even contributing to us. So with that, one here, Jean-Marie is here with us. I'm handing over back to Jean-Marie. Yes. Uh... Thank you very much, Sajad. I had to leave that for you because it was a very interesting and impactful panel. Thank you very much. 
thank you to the distinguished panelists for also very practical and showing so much commitment towards um, economic inclusion. And as Sajja just mentioned right now, exclusion is costly. And all the panelists have insisted and emphasized um, that in economic inclusion is a win-win situation. We see, and in Kenya, for example, including more refugees means contributing to the revenue and the economics. So I think the message is clear and really a pleasure to be moderating this session and to hear the commitment from the panelists. So thank you very much. Um, I just have to say that uh, the, my, my colleagues now, refugees who are appreciative of being part of this forum, uh, express uh, so much uh, request in terms of being engaged in policy and policy formulation because we talked about local actors, local partners. And so hearing it from the panelists as well, that has been very inspiring. Thank you, Sajad. And a round of applause to our panel. Um, at this time, I will invite um, uh, some submission. Uh, sorry. Yes, um, I want to invite the government of Uganda to um, make a statement from the floor. Uh, a very good uh, afternoon, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, the panelists for the submissions that have been made. I think on the part of the government of Uganda, my name is Agre uh, David Chivenge. I'm permanent secretary at the Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. And I'm happy uh, to be here this afternoon. I'm sure we all know that Uganda has uh, policies in place uh, that support and enhance uh, inclusion in the or economic participation of the refugees uh, who we see as a resource. There are progressive policies towards employment uh, of the refugees with opportunities provided to them uh, for self-reliance, including the right uh, to work and this is reflected uh, not only uh, in the constitution, which guarantees any person in the country a right to work, but also uh, the various laws that the country has put in place. But uh, I think for this uh, particular fora, we've gone a step further by coming up with the jobs uh, and Livelihoods Integrated Response Plan that looks at the host communities and the refugees. And in that plan, we have five strategic objectives, one of which is to promote peaceful coexistence and socio-economic interaction. Yes, the uh, government of uh, Canada, I'll uh, request you to... Uh, finish. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Let's try uh, just do a little bit more, but uh, we have a long line and we'd love to hear everyone, but go ahead. Okay, more. so the integrated response plan is one such vehicle that we are using to make sure that refugees are afforded an opportunity just like uh, the host communities of yes. uh, participating uh, in creating opportunities for employment, in promoting uh, self-reliance, in participating in social uh, sustainable economic activities, improved food and nutrition programs, but also rallying uh, the private sector to invest in the refugee and host uh, communities. Yeah. Of course, like every, every country has been observing here, the issue is the international community needs to come in to support right. these countries, um, yes, including thank you. Uganda. Thank you I very think. much. I think we have had from the morning session, even from the plenary, that the Uganda 
uh, has a really very progressive uh, response and and thanks for also pointing out the integrated mechanism i will ask the next uh, uh, speaker from the floor and i will request we only have 90 seconds so please uh, for the rest of us so european investment bank Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ben Berkua from European Investment Bank. I have the honor today to speak for the European Union. Um, uh, the U European Union is committed um, um, to supporting economic inclusion of uh, refugees and displaced persons, uh, enhancing um, their social protection, workforce integration, skills development, and labor force integration. Um, within the European Union, through the European Partnership for Integration, uh, the EU will um, will strengthen cooperation between key actors of the labor market and through the um, uh, sorry so through the asylum migration and integration fund will provide six million euros um, to um, for transnational projects um, to support integration into the labor market the EU will further mobilize the European social fund plus and uh, continue to consult uh, um, refugees uh, on uh, policy initiatives concerning them um, in support of refugee hosting countries, the European Union will implement economic resilience programs amounting to 184 million euro, um, facilitate private sector engagement, um, and invest in production of um, socioeconomic microdata uh, in partnership with others. As part of Team Europe, uh, European Investment Bank um, um, impl implements uh, EU policy through its um, um, through its operational approach to migration and uh, forced displacement. Um, it invests in projects on climate adaptation, um, urban development and social infrastructure, and financial inclusion uh, in order to support uh, uh, and create sustainable pathways for economic and social inclusion of uh, refugees. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, and you kept time. Thank you, I appreciate for that. And now we'll have the government of Italy. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. My name is Armen Razarian. I'm the head of migration service of, of the Ministry of Interior of Armenia. So uh, all the most important things about this topic have already been said by the panelists, but I'll have to repeat it because I have it in my speech. So what, what can you do about this? So uh, the, access, quick, eh? yeah, <laughs> the access to labor market and entrepreneurial activity is key to a flourishing community and harmony. So this is what we are constantly observing in all the refugee situations around the world. Uh, allowing refugees and displaced populations access to our labor markets, as well as the possibility to create their own live livelihoods, not only prevents them from alienation and destitution, but also paves the way for their successful integration into our societies and creates healthy communities. So this is what we have enshrined in our legislation, in the legislation of Armenia, uh, giving asylum seekers and refugees the right to seek employment and to work in our country uh, as equals to our citizens. Uh, there were many success stories uh, among entrepreneurial activities, for example, of Syrian refugees in Armenia and entrepreneurship uh, was driven by the necessity and by their resilience. And our government uh, on par with uh, international colleagues and local organizations and host communities has uh, significantly assisted refugees to engage in our labor market and entrepreneurship. Yes, thank this you is very much. And wrapping up I, with I, the last I, sentence. <laughs> it's really interesting how we have so much in this session. But anyway, so go ahead. So uh, we have re recently faced a displacement of 100,000 refugees from Nagorno-Karabakh, and we are planning to engage them in our labor market as well. So we think this is the way forward yes. and thank you very much thank you thank you thank you and and thank you for uh, really allowing the refugees to access work and right to work thank you very much at this time i want to welcome uh, the government of finland to take the stage ethiopia oh sorry the government of ethiopia sorry good afternoon everyone thank you moderator my name is aftam minister of water and uh, energy from ethiopia <clears throat> to create an environment conducive to realization of our commitment, Ethiopia enacted a refuge proclamation in 2019, which means we have a law that is supporting that. Since that, we have made we have made significant progress in providing economic opportunities for refugees, focusing on agriculture, livestock, 
market system development, financial inclusion, and accredited skill training. Today, we proudly share that 38,621 refugees have benefited from joint projects, self and wage employment opportunities with 16,996 refugees granted resident and work permits. Therefore, we need support as well for what we have been doing so far in terms of supporting the refugees resource. We have endorsed the pledge to improve enabling environment for private sector engagement, for innovation and digitalization as well. In conclusion, the government of Ethiopia hopes multi-stakeholder pledge will serve as a platform to promote synergies and the matching opportunities between pledging entities and other stakeholders to fulfill implementation of pledges and mobilize resources based on the burden and responsibility sharing principles of GCR and CRRF. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, the government of Ethiopia, for the submission. Uh, this time, it's my distinguished pleasure to invite the Minister of, uh, uh, to invite Ms. Sabrina Agres Robash to make her statement. Welcome. I give a round of applause to Sabrina. Thank you very much. Thank you. We speak in French. <laughs> Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous remercie de me donner l'opportunité de présenter devant vous les actions que porte la France, des actions fortes, et que la France met en œuvre en faveur de l'accueil des réfugiés. Le programme d'accompagnement global et individualisé des réfugiés, Agir, est un programme prioritaire pour le gouvernement français. Il a été lancé fin 2022. Il est désormais actif dans la moitié des territoires, du territoire national en France et sera globalisé sur l'ensemble du territoire national français dès 2024. Agir est un programme ambitieux qui nous permet de mieux accompagner les réfugiés tout en gardant cette humanité qui est pour nous et pour la France très importante. Vous le savez, plus de 500 000 réfugiés et bénéficiaires de la protection internationale résident en France. Et nous en accueillons plus de 50 000 nouveaux chaque année. Il nous faut les accueillir et les accompagner dans les meilleures conditions possibles afin qu'ils puissent s'intégrer pleinement. C'est une nécessité pour notre pays et pour le monde entier. C'est également un devoir auquel nous ne devons pas nous soustraire. Nous devons poursuivre la tradition d'accueil de la France en faveur des femmes et des hommes présents dans notre pays et qui viennent se réfugier chez nous. Agir vise à, systém à systém systématiser l'accompagnement global vers l'emploi, le logement et l'accès aux droits de tous les bénéficiaires en besoin d'accompagnement. Le programme se déploie localement sous l'autorité du préfet qui mobilise tous les partenaires de la société civile. Dans chaque département, c'est un opérateur associatif qui est choisi par l'État pour gérer le guichet unique dédié à l'intégration des réfugiés. Notre objectif est de construire pour chaque réfugié un parcours d'intégration territorialisé et structuré. Afin de se reconstruire, nous le savons, les réfugiés ont besoin de temps pour se refaire, comme on dit en français, une santé. Pour cette raison, l'accompagnement individuel peut aller jusqu'à 24 mois. Aujourd'hui, plus de 13 000 bénéficiaires de la protection internationale ont déjà été orientés vers le programme Agir. Notre objectif pour la fin 2023 est d'accueillir 15 000 réfugiés de plus sur ce programme. La généralisation du programme d'ici l'été 2024 permettra d'orienter de 35 000 à 40 000 réfugiés. Les premières données dont je dispose, notamment, sont très claires. L'efficacité du programme Agir est réelle dans l'amélioration de la situation des bénéficiaires. Juste quelques chiffres. Merci, merci Mister. Ah. Mister, merci. merci. Je n'ai pas fini. <rire> 10 des réfugiés accompagnés seront en amélioration de leurs conditions de logement 9 des réfugiés accompagnés progressent dans leur insertion professionnelle. Renforcer l'intégration des réfugiés et favoriser leur accès à l'autonomie sont un enjeu pour la France. Et juste un dernier mot pour finir. 
pour, le, pour mon pays, pour le portefeuille que j'ai, c'était extrêmement important d'être ici parmi vous. Et donc, je vous remercie. Thank you. I'm sorry, Minister, for cutting you. I'm sorry, but thank you very much for your submission. I appreciate it. And I, my colleagues tell me there's still one more. So, Sida, take the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Torbjörn Pettersson, representing the government of Sweden in this. And we are very happy to be part of this mega pledge. Sweden has uh, explicit goals in all our bilateral and multilateral development cooperation strategies to improve the opportunities for productive employment with decent working conditions for migrants, refugees, and internally displaced persons, uh, with this emphasis on women's economic empowerment. So we support many of the activities we heard about in the panel today, not least EGAT, where I see my, my old friends, where I worked a lot with in the past. But what I want to, to talk about very briefly now is one very important element of that, which this, which is uh, mobilizing private sector investment. So two examples, part of this pledge from our side is that we support Uganda through the guarantee program co-designed with UNHCR and Grameen Credit Agricole Foundation to strengthen refugees resilience and employment and to reduce dependent on, dependence on humanitarian aid. Sweden continues this work and staying in East Africa. Uh, an example is that we are supporting financial inclusion for refugees and hosting communities entrepreneurs in Kenya through a new refugee guarantee with Danish Refugees Council and Kenya Commercial Bank of 2 million euros. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ifat Sharif. I'm the Global Director for Social Protection. I'd like to make three points, hopefully organized in 30-second buckets, so we get 90 seconds out. Um, the first point I want to make is that, you know, at the World Bank Social Protection and Jobs Portfolio, we cover uh, around 267 million beneficiaries, uh, uh, poor beneficiaries across 80 countries in an investment portfolio of $28 billion. The encouraging news for us is that within that portfolio, we are increasingly covering uh, our interventions uh, are covering uh, refugees and forcefully displaced population. In fact, we have a very impressive engagement in, in Ethiopia where we are supporting the government and working together uh, in that support. My second point is within this intervention that we do, there is one that I would like to point out that we actually have a package called economic inclusion, uh, which is really uh, supported by a unique partnership that we have. It's called Partnership for Economic Inclusion that consists actually of our UN partners, civil society partners, NGOs, uh, development partners, where we really have this uh, intervention that is proven to be very effective. It's a, it's, it's a layered set of services that is built on uh, cash transfers with business skills training, coaching, mentoring, uh, financial inclusion, market access that are showing excellent results on the ground. You know, just uh, the recent results from Niger tells us that, you know, it, with an investment of between, uh, you know, 15 to $30 per month, you know, beneficiaries here, mainly female beneficiaries, are actually finding business revenue going up by 100 and so percentage points, consumption going up for 15 percentage points. So these are really excellent results, and we really hope that we can scale this up. And this leads to my third point, which is, and final point, which is that we would like to raise our ambition to actually double our coverage of beneficiaries uh, with such interventions, including uh, refugees and forcibly displayed population. And here, again, we cannot do this alone. So we really would like to see as many of you Thank who can support us and join us in that effort. Yes. Let me end there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. I, I have to say that uh, this has been the most easiest but also hard job to have to cut, but uh, I know that the conversation about economic inclusion is something we can speak about the whole day, but thank you all for being attentive and for our first panel and uh, for the uh, submissions from the floor. Now we'll move to the next panel, um, next uh, panel, which will be will be moderated by a smile. Just a moment, sorry. Um, I am pleased uh, to introduce Ms. Nasra Ismail, 
who will moderate our second panel featuring partnerships and initiatives by government, civil society, and the private sector. In addition to offering closing remarks, Ms. Ismail is a board member of Refuge Point and the US Executive Director for Allied. Uh, Ms. Ismail, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, my friend, Shimweg, our great MC, hand of applause. It's very, very hard to make sure that we are on time and be respectful to everybody, including all of you, but our speakers as well. I had this whole framing, forget it. We're going straight into the conversation. I hope you agree. For two seconds though, I want you to be attentive. So stretch a little bit, take some time. I know it's warm in here, but this is gonna be a great second panel. So just take some time, give us some energy. Yay. <laughs> If there's one thing I'll say is we're really talking about implementation models that are innovative from across sectors. So joining me today here at this panel is the Vice Minister for International Cooperation, Ministry of Netherlands, Pascale Rotenhaus. I hope I got that right. Very well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we also have State Secretary for Development Policy, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Denmark, Lotte Machon. Hand of applause for everybody. We have Secretary of Equality and Inclusion for Nuevo Leon, Mexico, Ms. Marta Herrera. We have Community Construction Founder and CEO, Mr. <laughs> Hadayat Ocean. We have a core Chief Sustainability Officer and Executive Committee member, Ms. Brun Poisson. And finally, we have Tent Partnership for Refugees, Vice President for the Americas and Global Strategy, Ms. Scarlett Cronin. Let's kick things off. Madam Vice Minister, I've been hearing wonderful things about something called Prospect Partnership, and I'd like to ask you, how is refugees' economic inclusion advancing self-reliance, economic development, and resilience for refugees and host countries looking like from your perspective? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. It's oh, sorry. Thank you very much for the question, and um, I think it's one of the best programs we have. We have a launch later on, so you're all invited. So thank you very much for the question. I think um, supporting refugee economic inclusion through employment and entrepreneurship is at the heart of the Netherlands approach to responsibility sharing. Our experience shows that given the opportunity, refugees can provide for themselves and their families and contribute to the wealth and prosperity of the countries and communities that host them. Unlocking and activating this potential, however, is not easy. It requires flexible, long-term support uh, so that hosting governments can compensate for the shock of displacements. And by hiring more teachers, strengthening the water mains, uh, broadening the electricity grids, increasing budget of municipalities to provide services to new residents, this is possible. And then, of course, it also requires support in ensuring that uh, economic inclusion does not come at the expense of the vulnerable people already living there in the host communities. <clears throat> and this is perhaps the hardest of all challenges we are facing, and it looks different for every hosting country. And Prospects, you mentioned it already, is our way of ho offering this type of support. And we do this in a tailored way. And not through one single organization, and I think that's one of the things that I'm proudest of, but through the partnership of five key actors uh, who we believe are best placed to assist hosting governments. And that is UNHCR, and thank you for organi organizing uh, today, for its unique refugee protection mandate. It's UNICEF for its expertise in education. It's the ILO for its efforts to ensure decent work to all. I uh, heard uh, you, you speaking about it uh, just now. The World Bank for its unrivaled expertise in public uh, sector support, and last but certainly not least, IFC, with its bold ambition to support involvement of the private sector in refugee hosting regions. So Prospects has enabled these partners to work through closely aligned programs and producing results that neither of them would have done by themselves. So it's about aligning education and apprenticeship trajectories so that young refugees can smoothly transition from school to work. It's about supporting commercially viable cooperatives that includes refugees. It's about trying to counter refugee protection challenges in the global gig economy. 
It's about supporting the infrastructural projects that offer temporary work and relieve pressure on refugees and host communities. And as a result of these very joint efforts in the past four years, we have assisted, we have assisted over 350,000 people in income generation, helped create about 60,000 jobs, and supported more than a million people in social protection. And just as importantly, we also have improved access to school for 1.2 million young people. Amen. And all of these groups include refugees and their host communities. Um, but still, the challenges remain. And as this year's World Development uh, Report argues, the challenges of refugees facing um, are more severe um, and they will be more severe if the refugees are kept economically isolated, geographically concentrated and have limited freedom of movement. So we are therefore uh, particularly heartened by the recent policy uh, shifts, for instance, in Kenya and Ethiopia, which both made important steps in moving from encampments to settlements and improving the refugees' ability to move to work and to open businesses. And our funding in those countries can now travel further and have a larger impact. And we are proud, and we will launch it, uh, I think, in, uh, in less than an hour, that we will uh, fund the new four-year cycle and we increase from 500 million to 800 million euro. And in today's political difficult landscape, it's uh, it's good news, we think. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad we can be part of that. So thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> that was amazing. And congratulations on the launch, a powerful partnership, a different um, kind of partnership. Madam Secretary, Denmark has been mark making remarkable commitment to advanced partnership and nexus approaches along with protection and socioeconomic development among displaced communities. What recommendations do you have based on your experience for multi-stakeholder partnerships and programming as a, an enabler for self-reliance and ultimately creating durable solutions? Thank you, Chair. And uh, so first, let me say uh, how proud Denmark is to be co-leading on the economic inclusion and multi-stakeholder initiative. We do believe that this will be one of the initiatives that are truly transformative that coming out of the Refugee Forum place to be here. I do believe that we will be able to uh, demonstrate that uh, by doing cross-sectoral partnership, we can actually deliver the much needed solutions uh, to, uh, to the increasing refugee crisis. And I think as a bilateral donor uh, like Denmark, we have a special obligation to, to show how we can use complementarity between humanitarian and development aid and get it to work across silos, across parallel programming tracks and sort of get to scale impact and efficiency together with other partners, not least from the private uh, sector. And Denmark has done exactly that over the last couple of years. Just two examples in that regard, if you allow me. One is uh, a program we do in uh, in Syria, uh, in Jordan and Lebanon. Uh, it's a regional approach, as was alluded to by the EGET chair just earlier. It's called the Regional Development and Protection Program. Uh, we implement it together with a host of other countries, including the EU and the Netherlands, uh, sitting at the table. Uh, the RDPP, as we call it, embodies the whole uh, principle around refugees' economic inclusion as the key to sound local development. The experience is here, and it was also said in the previous panel, that by enabling refugees to participate in the local uh, communities, in the host communities' economies, it benefits both the host and the refugees. Um, it's about private sector partnership for job creation and employability. It's also about the decent work environment, as was said by ILO earlier, and also about entrepreneurship. We do have a sort of key component that is also about learnings, a sort of experience-based and data-driven policy dialogue to, uh, to harvest the, uh, the knowledge that we gain uh, across the program. Second example that I will quickly mention is uh, a new and I think quite exciting alliance that uh, Denmark is spearheading together with three philanthropic foundations from uh, Denmark, Novo Nordisk Foundation, Lego Foundation and the Grundfos Foundation. Um, and, and I think there are really three and it's happening in, in Kenya. 
in trying to get the inclusion of refugees in national and county service delivery, and thereby sort of transitioning out of humanitarian aid into development aid and crowding in uh, more more finances. Because I think there is really threefold uh, things that comes out of this initiative, and that's. First, it's about getting more finance to crowd in uh, additional finances for the solutions through having both our ODA and then the uh, foundation's uh, finance coming in. It's about uh, expertise from the private philanthropic uh, foundation. And here it's about health, education and uh, and water, uh, and then match it with the local competencies and our, what can I say, the MFA's long presence in Kenya. And then thirdly, uh, about impact, that we can uh, scale up the self-reliance and, and ultimately create uh, more sustainable solutions for the long run. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Scale, impact, efficiency. I very much appreciated those examples. Um, moving into Mexico, Minister Herrera, and I know for those of you who might not know Spanish, you can put on your audience um, uh, equipment. Minister Herrera, considering the significant potential that refugees bring to our global economy, and especially in Mexico, what specific strategies and policies is your department implementing to facilitate their integration into Nuevo León's workforce? Muchas gracias. Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Es un verdadero honor estar aquí reconocidos. Cuando hablamos de migración y de asilo, tenemos que hablar del reconocimiento de los derechos de igualdad y sin discriminación. Los retos globales actuales requieren de acciones de nosotros que sean urgentes y que sean incluyentes. Y a manera de contexto, quiero decirles que México, que es un país de origen, es un país de destino, de tránsito, de retorno y de asilo. Y es el tercer país del mundo con mayor número de solicitudes con refugio. Y a nivel estatal, Nuevo León es la sexta entidad que más solicitudes recibe y, y es quien mayor número de personas reubicadas tiene por la ACNUR. Gracias a la cultura de trabajo, al capital humano y al ecosistema industrial que tenemos y la cercanía con Estados Unidos, debo señalar que Nuevo León es uno de los estados más prósperos y atractivos para vivir ahorita en México y en América Latina. Nuevo León tiene un boom económico con la llegada del 45% del New Shoring con destino a América Latina y el 76% de México. Se estima que la inversión pueda ascender en los próximos años a 37 billones de dólares. Todo esto es un reto, por lo que estamos promoviendo la generación de riqueza sostenible para que pueda llegar a todas las personas y podamos generar los mecanismos de inclusión que garanticen la progresividad de los derechos a través de la innovación, a través del emprendimiento, a través de acciones reales y concretas que puedan cubrir las exigencias de esta expansión económica de las empresas de alto valor agregado. Aunque las atribuciones en materia migratoria son en su mayoría de orden federal, en nuestro estado, con mucha voluntad política, creamos políticas públicas que reconocen los derechos de todas las personas. Nuestro primer paso fue la creación y funcionamiento de espacios de igualdad e inclusión para personas migrantes y refugiados, donde acercamos y ofrecemos servicios para lo que nosotros hemos llamado inclusión total bajo una estrecha coordinación con el sector privado, con las universidades, con las organizaciones de la sociedad civil, con organismos del sistema de ONU, y hemos acompañado a más de 8 mil personas de 36 nacionalidades en 14 mil atenciones este año. A través de este proceso que hacemos de acompañamiento, de asistencia legal y orientación, hemos habilitado herramientas para que todas las personas y sus familias sean incluidas en nuestro sistema de protección social con un enfoque de interculturalidad, con el objetivo de garantizar acceso a los derechos básicos como alimentación, salud, educación, vivienda, trabajo e ingreso digno. Y asimismo, nuestro programa de inclusión laboral busca incorporar a todas las personas en situación de movilidad al trabajo formal y orientar a las empresas acerca de una contratación ética a través de un enfoque de derechos humanos. Solo este año hemos acompañado a 5,000 personas a través de estas acciones. Hoy México ha asumido la obligación de alcanzar para el 2025 10 compromisos que garantizarán mejores prácticas para la promoción, el respeto, la protección y garantía a sus derechos humanos. Específicamente Nuevo León propuso cuatro de estos 10 compromisos. Amigas y amigos, la humanidad debe compartir un destino común. La promoción de los valores de igualdad, no discriminación y justicia no conocen fronteras ni barreras. Cuentan con nosotros para que con acción, 
unidad y impacto podamos cumplir con los objetivos. Desde Nuevo León seguiremos escuchando y empoderando a las personas migrantes y refugiadas, abrazando las diferencias y aprendiendo de la riqueza de su diversidad y deseando que Nuevo León se convierta en la esperanza de su nuevo hogar. Ah, gracias. Minister Herrera, thank you so much. The power of politics to move us into the powerful policy measures you put in place. My very little Spanish, I want to say, quiero visitar a México a hoy. <laughs> Gracias. Welcome. <laughs> Fabulous. Moving to a personal story, a different kind of story. Mr. Ocean, you've had an incredible journey and have achieved so much, notably starting a social enterprise that provides training and employment opportunities for refugees and asylum seekers in Australia. What are some of the challenges you face in starting your business? We'd love to know what some of the enabling factors have also been for you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Nasta. And also, I would like to thank you, UNHCR, for giving me this opportunity to come here. Um, as you know, if being a refugee, it's very tough to find a job, live alone, starting a business. And um, I studied politics and international relations. So when I found that 63% of refugees remain unemployed in their first 10 years in, in Australia, uh, I decided to do something for them, and um, I had that determination, and also, and that was very close to my heart because I am a refugee. I, I got through that journey, and um, uh, when I started, um, I had no idea how to navigate the system, getting insurance, giving proper license, and also um, just um, all the legal compliance. And the second problem was a lack of network in the industry. As you know, construction is a very competitive industry. Getting to the market is very tough. Um, if you um, do some wrong things in the project, then it will lead to millions of dollar damage. So that's why a lot of companies, they, they are reluctant to deal with new, com new company like my one. And the third one was a language barrier. Uh, when I was com talking with uh, some big company, they were saying, uh, you're um, the entire team are refugee. How are we going to communicate with your employee? If there's something happen, you, you can be on the side all the time. So that was the other problem. And also lack of funding for social enterprise uh, in general, even though uh, social enterprise can significantly reduce the cost of settlement. Um, like in Australia, we have um, uh, 12,000 social enterprise and they make a huge contribution to Australian economy. On the other hand, um, what really helped me to succeed uh, my business, uh, there was a massive opportunity in the construction industry. Um, when I started my social enterprise in 2006, um, there was 26% labor shortage in the construction industry. And that was a key for me to get to the market. And also, uh, Australian people, they are very supportive. To be honest, I'm so lucky to be a part of this uh, society, which they are very friendly, they are very supportive. And that's why when I do some public speaking like um, these events, on the next day, I receive like hundreds of emails from Australian people, and they want to make changes, and they want to help me. And also refugees, are, they are very hard worker. They are very resilient. I can assure you, if you guys hire a refugee, um, definitely you can succeed because they put all their energy. They can put all their effort to make a changes. They, they want to be independent. They don't want to, want to be like um, a part of uh, um, burden to society. And also um, um, uh, social enterprise is a very unique approach. Um, as I mentioned, like we have 12,000 uh, social enterprise in, in Australia, and they contribute around 21 billion uh, contribution to Australian economy, and they employ 200,000 people, and half of them are from disadvantaged community, like refugees, and 77% of revenue come through the cell revenue, and 30% uh, of them are completely self uh, self-funded organization, like my social enterprise, we never receive any funding from uh, external uh, organization. So community construction, we empower refugees to become a, uh, uh, like a, a valued member of society. We help them to give them tools and also job training to contribute, to build a stable life and also um, um, be a part of a positive part of society. So at the end, I want to say like, if a refugee can help hundreds of people, why can you? Thank you very much. Amazing. Amazing. It's an important and something I really hope we're all going to take seriously after this. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Ossian. Um, private sector, uh, Ms. Poisson, 
Their core group holds a central position as a global leader in the hospitality sector, and it's committed to creating meaningful opportunities for refugees worldwide. What drives a core to pursue these commitments? And more importantly, what are the impacts on industry and on refugee? And if you could work in a couple examples on women particularly, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, you know, you said it all, you know, why would private companies work with uh, refugees? I think it's pretty obvious when we hear what you just uh, shared. And so that's one of the reasons why Accor as a hospitality company, and you know, when you work in the hospitality sector, by definition, one of your key job or key mission is to uh, host people, so to be welcoming. So I guess it's also one of the reasons why we decided to uh, really focus heavily uh, on welcoming refugees. Now, once you've said that, how do we go about doing it? I strongly believe that we need a method, we need a way of working, and we need to work out the how. And that's what we've been striving to do over the past uh, few years, I would say. So how do we do that? First of all, by collaborating. You mentioned that as well. Uh, I don't see how we can solve such intractable problems like, uh, you know, refugees and, and, and wars and those issues without working hand in hand uh, with a host of partners. And that's exactly what we do when we work with, for example, um, 10 Partnership for Refugees or Refugees Are Talents. We believe in the power of coalition. We believe uh, that it's by joining forces that we can find sustainable uh, solutions that really have impact. In addition to that, uh, what we want is focus on women. Why? I mean, it's not to say that the other refugees are not important, not at all. It's just that when you focus on women, you also target children, which are obviously a key part of uh, getting embedded into a society, obviously. And so how do we do that by, for example, partnering with uh, the United Nations, but also most importantly, by providing, them, by providing them with the skills that they might need to get a job after that? Because just like what a lot of panelists have said, we believe that economic inclusion is actually the best way of empowering refugees and making sure that they can bring to the host country or to the companies they're working in, the best of their knowledge, of their talents, really. And so that's what uh, we focus on. We've partnered with a host of NGOs, providing them with funding and allowing them to test uh, different solutions. I'm not going to go through that in details, but we strongly believe that it's through coalition by targeting women and supporting NGOs, testing out new ways of providing skills to migrants and refugees that, you can, that we can have impact as a global company. And when I say we, I really mean we, Accor, obviously, but the private sector at large. Thank you. Fabulous, fabulous. The power of coalitions across differences. I love that. Um, that leads me to Ms. Cronin. I wonder, and I heard that during GRF 2019, the 10th Partnership for Refugees mobilized something like 44 businesses to pledge for jobs and improved access for services for refugees globally. How has the TENT partnership evolved in the past four years? What, what have you been up to when it comes to impact across Europe and the Americas? And where are you headed next? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. It is an honor to be on this panel um, and to be at GRF this year as we were back in 2019. So just very briefly, for those of you who may not know TENT, we are an organization founded by um, a Turkish uh, CEO in the United States. He runs a company called Chobani, a yogurt and food company. Um, and it, we have a very singular mission, which is to mobilize as many leading companies as possible to either employ refugees directly or help refugees become job ready. This is based 100% on Hamdi's personal experience hiring refugees in the U.S. for years. Um, refugees make up 30% of the company's workforce, and as we heard from um, as we heard from other panelists, it is of course because of the fact that refugees bring the loyalty, the dedication, the resilience, the work ethic to the job every single day that we know to be true. However, what Hamdi noticed, and the reason he started Tent, is that many companies several years ago, back in 2016 when Tent was first founded, weren't necessarily looking to refugees as a talent pool and looking at them uh, to bring in all the ingenuity and resilience that they know they do. So that's why um, we started Tent. And again, we are just 
single-handedly day-to-day focused um, on helping companies hire refugees. We do so by providing strategic and practical guidance uh, to companies, making, making it very hard for them to say no to us, and then opening up our network of 350 businesses um, who we work with now to be able to look into best practices, insights around issues like language barriers or transportation barriers so that companies can learn um, from one another. So we are now active in 11 markets doing just that. Um, and to answer the question, since the last GRF four years ago, we have stayed very true to this mission and, in fact, only narrowed in on this focus on employment and working side by side uh, with companies by building out our own staff um, and building out our own in-house expertise. So back in 2019, we made a pledge uh, to mobilize businesses to hire and place more than 12,500 refugees into jobs. Very pleased to report that we have completed that original goal. We have surpassed it. Um, the companies we work with have collectively hired uh, more than 13,500 refugees to date. And then I'm honored to share Tent's new pledge, uh, which again, just fits so centrally with the work we do day in, day out. Um, and that is to get leading companies to go beyond philanthropy, philanthropy Philanthropy, of course, has a very important place, but we are focused on jobs to lead to long-term integration um, and support for refugees. So um, our new pledge is to mobilize 150 businesses. Um, this is throughout Europe, North America, and Latin America, where we work, to publicly pledge to provide jobs, training, as well as mentorship, which I'll be speaking about in the next ses uh, session. And specifically, these businesses will aim to, I'll get these numbers right, hire 37,000 refugees directly, connect 170,000 refugees into work, provide training opportunities to 100, 130,000 refugees, and provide mentorship to 8,000 refugees. Um, we are so grateful to the many companies that we work with, of course, Accor, but also Adeco, Foundeavor, Generali, Adidas, many that are here with us today. And then, of course, we're so grateful to our partnership with UNHCR. Thank you. Amazing. Amazing. I know, I know what you're thinking. We could really do this for another round of three questions, but this is just the starter. So I hope you mingle. I hope you follow up. Um, I want to hand it back uh, to Shumwei. But before I do that, I want to thank everybody on the stage with me. Thank you for your patience. We ran a little bit over time, but somehow we're still made it. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to say as a moderator, privilege, the organizers, if you if we know your name or not, we see you. We benefit from your work. Thank you so much. I didn't want to end this without saying thank you to everybody. People who put water here, people who helped us get on stage. Thank you. And back to you, Shimwe. Yes. Um, I think we can do a better job. Let's clap for the panel again. That's, that's a round of applause to the panel. Um, so thank you, Nasra. Um, I, I think you're not, uh, it's, not it's not the last time you're going to be speaking. Jordan will be calling you again. But I wanted to say one thing, uh, and this is something I heard from somewhere, that alone you can go far, but together we can go farthest. I think this is the message that we are all getting from this panel. And I've gotten a couple of uh, statements when everyone was speaking that I'd love to just uh, share. So I had sustainable solutions, uh, economic inclusion, job readiness. I had uh, welcoming methods of working, collaboration, independence, private sector, job creation, innovation, and all these great things. This is what happens when we come together and start discussing. So really appreciative to the panel and to the first panel. You also see the connection between policy and evidence and partnerships and initiatives that we all have to find out coming together. At this time, I have the very difficult job again to call people on the floor, but I, I hope that we can respect the time because we, we run a bit over. So we'll start the interventions, and there will be more interventions and also pledges. We only have 90 minutes, uh, 90 seconds to do that. And uh, first to come over the stage is Kiva. 90 minutes. Um, no. No is what most refugees hear when they try to access loans from formal financial institutions who deem them too risky to lend to. My name is Lev, and I'm with Kiva, and this is where we come in. For those who might not be familiar, Kiva is the world's largest crowdfunding platform for social good, where anybody can visit our website, so anybody here, and make a loan as little as $25 to an entrepreneur somewhere in the world. Since 2016, we've specifically been mobilizing our crowdfunding platform to lend to refugees, and we reached over 37,000 refugees with more than $33 million in loans. 
And these refugees, you might not be shocked to hear, have repaid their loans at over 96%, demonstrating the viability of lending to and investing in this population and uh, breaking longstanding misconceptions in the process. We've actually uh, built on this and we've launched one of the first uh, investment funds in the space. Uh, refugees have been so reliable that we've launched the Kiva Refugee Investment Fund, raising over $32 million in private investment capital to further scale financial inclusion efforts for refugees. And we're here at the GRF to commit our, uh, our, our pledge to scale this work by reaching 150,000 refugees, 150,000 more with $150 million in loans by 2028 uh, with effective evidence-based and innovative financial services. So thank you. We welcome those to partner with us because we can't do this alone in making financial inclusion a reality for refugees. Thank, thank you, Kiva. And I will request the audience that we can be silent. So uh, over to IKEA. Welcome. Yeah. Hello, my name is Lars. I'm from IKEA. And I'm uh, happy to uh, and excited to announce uh, the new uh, renewed commitments to support the integration of refugees across IKEA. And uh, with these commitments, we continue to support refugees in finding meaningful work and promoting their social inclusion. So I have four things to share with you. Uh, the first thing is that in inter -IKEA group, we continue our, our partnership with the River Jordan Foundation. And uh, we are continuing our long-term employment with 400 refugee women and local female artisans and uh, co-creating uh, products for IKEA. And the second thing is that uh, with the IKEA Social Entrepreneurship, along with Cisco Foundation and implementation partner Nest, we are supporting an initiative that aims to create 3,000 uh, new jobs, long-term jobs, that positively impact over 5,000 refugees and migrants in Poland and Romania. And uh, the third thing in Inca Group, what we are doing there, it's the largest IKEA retailer. We are launching a new commitment to increase the employ employability of over uh, an additional 3,000 refugees and asylum seekers by the end of 2027. So the fourth thing is that also in the IKEA Foundation, the strategic philanthropy philanthropy um, that operates independently from IKEA announced they will continue funding uh, of projects that builds economic self-reliance among refugees and their host communities. So as we say in IKEA, uh, let's work together, lead by example and get things done. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Let's lead by example. Um, next on stage is Finnish Refugee Council. Right. Uh, I'm going to provide a really quick snapshot to what uh, just was presented. So this is an um, uh, example of partnership between IKEA and uh, Finnish Refugee Council. We've been partnering um, and combining a Finnish Refugee Council job uh, training courses and mentoring for job seekers with refugee backgrounds and IKEA's readiness to support refugee employment and livelihoods during our initial pilot program, we've been piloting with um, 59, 60 refugees, had a life-changing opportunity to work in IKEA department stores for the period of three months uh, after first completing Finnish Refugee Council training program. And we celebrated the fact that far over half of them then uh, actually received a more permanent employment with IKEA. And this is uh, successful to the individuals and to the uh, actual recruiting company. And we are really encouraging other companies in Finland to follow this initiative. So cutting short here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we love fun ever. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Najat Tenutit, the managing director of Fondever.org, a soon to be launched uh, nonprofit on behalf of Fondever, a global leader in uh, the customer experience industry, a name you most probably don't know since we serve many of the big names company that you see here today. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, in Brazil, we have joined the Refugee Forum, an initiative that has resulted in 18 companies and organizations that have targets to achieve the hiring of 1,200 refugees and supporting over 15,000 refugees with technical and vocational training, including financial inclusion, by 2027. Fondeva in Brazil has pledged to hire another 400 refugees by 2027, resulting in 1,000 refugees uh, in total in our workforce in just that country alone. This concrete example of, Fondeva, of what Fondeva is doing in Brazil 
sets a baseline of what we aim to achieve globally with partners such as the UNHCR of the, or the 10 Partnership for Refugees. And we're just getting started. Next time in this global uh, refugee conference, global forum, I'd like to pledge for many more countries and I hope to see you all there at that moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. And for the encouragement, uh, welcome uh, Adeko. Esteemed speakers and guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to highlight today uh, ADECO's renewed commitment to inclusion of refugees. Uh, I'm Bruce, leading inclusion at ADECO. ADECO is a global le leading private intermediary on the labor market, providing employment and employability in 60 countries um, and territories throughout all industries and positions. We have been participating in the professional inclusion of refugees for more than 15 years across our markets. Being a member of the World Economic Forum and its Refugee Employment Alliance, we are committing to 85,000 refugees recruited and 17,000 upskilled by end 2027. This builds on the commitment we made in June 23 to help assign 50,000 refugees and upskill 10,000 of them by the end of 2025, a pledge we made as a proud partner of TENT uh, at their EU summit. At ADECO, we have the ambition to build employability for underserved and underprivileged populations. Uh, promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workforce. We serve together with our colleagues, clients, associates, and partners a common purpose, which is make the future work for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, pledges. And I will have uh, Talent Beyond Boundaries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Talent Beyond Boundaries exists to open up the world to refugees for work. So to enable refugees and make it possible for refugees to move internationally for work. And I'm here speaking on behalf of the Global Task Force on Refugee Labour Mobility. We have the deep conviction that international refugee labour mobility is part of the self-reliance agenda. This is a way that we can actually support refugees to build up their own self-reliance and have agency. And we need to connect these two agendas much more than we do at the moment. Um, we working together with partners have committed to the goal of supporting 200,000 refugees to be able to migrate on labour mobility and education pathways over the next five years. That's our ambitious goal. And in order to make this work, we really do need to connect these agendas by really supporting refugees to access the kind of training and education pathways in countries of origin where that will enable them to be competitive in the international market for work as well. So doing things like providing access to information to refugees, not only about work opportunities locally, but internationally as well. Supporting refugees to match with job opportunities, yes, locally in countries of first asylum, but also internationally as well. Removing legal barriers that prevent refugees from working and then supporting upskilling and reskilling and really seeing refugees as assets, not just for first countries of asylum, but for the international community as a whole. Uh, I really want to acknowledge as well Hediat, um, who is an example of an entrepreneur in Australia who has actually supported hiring refugees through this program as well. So backing refugee-led businesses is also part of this agenda. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you very much. And refugees are asset. asset. Thank you. Uh, we are running over a bit, but I, I wish to ask for your patience. So please, uh, Olive, um, OK, uh, from Made 51, welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Hisham Gazar from Yadawi uh, Social Enterprise in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, proudly a part of uh, Made 51 since 2017. Today, I would like to announce the Mid-51 pledge on behalf of our uh, ecosystem partners. Mid-51 was established by UNHCR in 2018 with the goal of transforming the lives of refugees by leveraging their unique skills and cultural backgrounds as part of a sustainable value chain. As Deputy uh, High Commissioner Kelly uh, Clements highlighted, Mid-51 showcases that given the chance refugees can thrive both locally and in the global marketplace. The Mid-51 pledge uses a, an ecosystem approach to leverage the unique uh, contributions of our stakeholders. Each has formulated a commitment to the Mid-51 pledge. Refugee artisans commit to building strong, culturally rich groups with effective leadership and ensure orders are properly met. They pledge to pass down their heritage skills, preserving traditions for future generations. 
local social enterprises commit to empower refugees' role in the value chain, ensuring ethical practices and, expand, uh, and expanding market access. UNHCR commits to global co coordination of MATE 51, managing the MATE 51 model, ensuring protection uh, standards as, uh, are in place, and coordinating the ecosystem. While this announcement, we, we call on the uh, private sector, uh, government uh, institutions, and foundations to join us, bringing their strengths for positive and lasting solution for refugees. Thank you. Thank you, so Mate 51. Thank you. Appreciate please, it. Please come visit us at uh, Mid 51 House to learn more about the pledge, uh, the products, and people behind Mid 51. We have amazing stories to tell. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you Mid 51. And next up on stage is Inko Moko. Uh, thank you. It is my great pleasure to renew Inko Moko's commitment. Micro and small businesses, including refugees, displaced communities in Africa, are key drivers of economic growth. They help build thriving communities and create pathways out of poverty. Ingomoko pledges 150 million in direct investment in local and private enterprises. This will support over 90,000 refugees and host communities, and among them, 60% women and 50% youth across six countries, enabling over 600,000 to live out of poverty by 2027. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nko Mwoko, International Refu Rescue Committee. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I will try to make the 90 seconds. My name is Priscilla Dembetembe. I represent the Rebuild Program, which is a program that seeks to help refugees in Nairobi, Kenya, and Uganda, uh, Kampala City. Uh, this program is being supported by the IKEA Foundation, and we work very closely with the two city authorities. I think a lot of us have heard today about the support that the local authorities need to be able to bear the burden of supporting the refugees. So Kampala City and Nairobi have come together to put together a joint pledge, which you will hear a little bit more about on Friday. And this pledge includes committing to carrying out comprehensive surveys by 2024 in order to ascertain refugee needs and subsequently drive in inclusive programs, which include skills enhancement and innovation centers that nurture entrepreneurship among refugees. Collaborating with NGOs, the cities have pledged to involve refugees in city planning, promotion of social cohesion, and participation in decision making. Our work is anchored on evidence that we have been generating in the work that we have been doing in the two cities, and you will be able to visit a little bit more and learn more about the work that Rebuild and the two cities have been doing. You can vis visit our website, www.rebuild.rescue.org, and of course, you can visit the GRF uh, virtual library. Thank, Thank you very you. much. You, <laughs> the 90 seconds. Um, well, so refugee-led research hub, over to you. I will make it much shorter, maybe 60 seconds. So my name is Mohammed. I'm from the Refugee Led Research Hub in Kenya. And we pledge to, I heard someone say before that we need more evidence to generate more data. So our pledge is to have more refugees in the knowledge production, to have them as a lead researchers and to look at the gap between the high level policy decisions that are made, the gap between policy and practice. So currently we have a study that is going on looking at refugee employment in 16 African countries. And we hope that the impact of this research is to make it easier for employers to hire refugees in a legal way. So thank you so much. Thank you. And last on stage is the Global Refugee Youth Network. Thank you. The Global Refugee Youth Network, a refugee youth-led organization, pledges to continue to play an indispensable role in generating crucial evidence through research Women refugee-led researchers significantly influ influence the employability and inclusion of refugees in host communities, especially refugee women and girls, and in turn affects their self-reliance. Evidence-based research becomes a potent tool for advocating policy changes. The data and insights, insights gathered 
by refugee-led organizations serve as a compelling narrative that resonates with policymakers, urging them to adopt measures conducive to refugee employment. The Global Refugee Youth Network's program coordinator, Fonny Joyce Wuni, in partnership with the University of Oxford's Refugee-Led Research Hub, recently published a paper on refugee access to work permits and business licenses in Kenya, this study explores the gaps between policy and practice of refugees, access to work permits, and identifies what support is needed to improve access to sustainable livelihoods for urban and camp refugees, including women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, everyone. Thank you, those uh, of us who are in the panel, um, the people from the floor. It is my distinguished uh, honor to close this session, but just to say thank you all. I want you to all clap for yourself first. Um, I know we would have wanted to continue and, and have this discussion for the whole day, but as everyone has said, uh, this is a discussion we can move forward. Uh, you can check out the multi-stakeholder uh, pledge on socioeconomic inclusion. For now, uh, please don't leave anything behind and we appreciate you. Thank you very much. <laughs>